Yes, miss, in the blue shirt. Um, this is very specific, but I'm curious what you think about the military draft with respect to freedom of religion and the First Amendment, um, kind of as a... As oh, a great, problem. great question. You know, Madison proposed uh, that the, the Second Amendment contain a right to, uh, of, of those who are, quote, religiously scrupulous not to be compelled to bear arms. It almost passed and didn't get through because of a coalition of practical problems. But it came very close and the uh, United States has had uh, some kind of religious exemption uh, from the beginning. Now, there's also the question of whether the draft itself is constitutional. Do, if we had time, that would be lovely to talk about. Um, there is a fairly substantial historical argument that army, did, the word army meant a volunteer professional fighting force. That's what it always had been. The militia was what you got drafted into. So there was compulsory military service in the militia, but the ar raising armies did not involve compulsory uh, service. And no less a figure than Daniel Webster in the 1840s argued that it was unconstitutional for the United States to draft people into the army. And it wasn't done uh, until the Civil War. So, Interesting set of questions. Uh, yes. So uh, in the Fourth Amendment, you know, it's unreasonable searches and seizures. And, you know, this has been included to allow things like eminent domain. And there is certain allowed seizures of government property. But, you know, would the founders really have considered these seizures of property to be reasonable? in their original constitutional framework? So are you referring to the problem of forfeiture when the police, you know, yes. for, for uh, I think this is a, I mean, your personal opinion, I think this practice is, uh, it should be struck down. Uh, I do not think that anyone <coughs> should lose their property without actually being convicted of the crime and where the legislature has specified that the forfeiture of the property is part of the, of the sentence for the crime. Uh, so I, and I suspect, the, I would not be at all surprised if the Supreme Court does something about this because we have a more liberty. People think about left and right too much. Uh, there are lots of other things going on in the left and right. We have a more libertarian Supreme Court today than in my lifetime. And so, you know, there are members of that court that I think will, you know, stand up to the police forces that, you know, finance their operations by confiscating people's automobiles and cash and so forth. So let's look for that. Yes, uh, here in the red. In Brutus number two, they talk about the right of enjoying and defending life, and you kind of hinted at that. Mm -hmm. And I was, we also, of course, have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I was wondering what you thought the founders thought of with what happiness means and what would it be enjoying life meant for Brutus. So happiness is a very uh, serious word for them. We now, I think, it's kind of a, deb it's one of those many words that have become kind of debased. And we think of happiness as just being, you know, sort of, I'm happy. But uh, uh, happiness was uh, a word that goes back in Western philosophy. Aristotle, for example, uh, 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 you know, happiness means human flourishing. And the, for them, the, the idea is many good things in life are good because they are instrumental to something else. You know, why do I want to be able to read? Well, it isn't because, you know, moving my eyes across the paper. It's because I want to be able to absorb ideas. Well, why do I want to be able to absorb ideas? Well, that's because of, you know, something else. At some point, you get to something and you say, you know, happiness in this sense or human flourishing 
is something you do not desire because it's going to be good for something else. It's like the ultimate. And, uh, and I think that when uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote of the pursuit of happiness, what he really means is that each person gets to decide for themselves what it is that is going to be the, the ultimate uh, good thing for them. Now, the defense part of it is also important. Uh, and I think if you had asked people around the time of the founding, what did they leave out? One of the first things that people would have said is a right of self-defense. It was one of the most important of the natural rights, and, and it's not there. Um, how about over here? I haven't hit the side of the room. I'm going to leave it a little open-ended, but can you talk about the, um, the intersection of the First Amendment and applying that to the social media space and big tech, and what, is, what, what rights do you think are protected explicitly? What is the role of, of government? Um, yeah, just I'm going to leave it pretty open-ended with that respect. Uh, so maybe this is what we should talk about next year. I mean, this could real. This is a huge and such an important topic. You know, I mean, the first order, which I assume everybody has thought about, is you know, social media companies are private companies, and so when they take down content, they're not the government, and the First Amendment doesn't apply. This is very similar to I've forgotten your name. Morgan's question about equal pay, because in both cases what we're talking about is uh, private rights against another private entity, and that's not what the First Amendment is about. Now, freedom of speech principles might be about that, and so as we, I think we care, at least I care, and I assume most of the people in the room probably care about free speech, even aside from you know, what's not in the First Amendment, and to have uh, particular gatekeepers that are as dominant as the uh, tech companies are um, uh, as you know, deciding what people can say and what they can't seems uh, sort of deeply disturbing. Uh, but before following, <laughs> sort of jumping in with uh, a, a governmental solution to that, you know, how much more disturbing would it be if it were the government deciding uh, what gets up on Facebook and what comes down. Uh, <coughs> now, the, uh, you know, and we've had this problem in other guises you know, from the time of the founding. So newspapers, for example, are private entities and they, uh, they carry you know, news and opinion. Um, you know, when during the ratification fights, there were some newspapers, most of them Federalists, by the way, um, that refused to carry letters and opinion pieces from the other side. They were on both sides, but it was heavily skewed. There were many more Federalist newspapers and anti-Federalist newspapers, and and one and it's really kind of an it's part of the dark history of ratification is that the anti-federalists had trouble getting their message through because the gatekeepers of the day were the newspapers. But I don't think there is any doubt that freedom of the press includes the right of those printers, those newspapers, uh, to decide what they were going to uh, print or not. Um, and in a sense, that's what we have today. We. Uh, you know, and, uh, in the day of, uh, you know, like my childhood, we had only, you know, there was no internet and we had three broadcast, t three TV broadcast companies that were all pretty much the same. That had a, that was stultifying and it was not exactly a free speech uh, ecosystem either. The internet looked like it was going to be, uh, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom but it turns out that letting a thousand flowers bloom doesn't really happen in you know this side of uh, of uh, heaven, and um, and and in an event in the end you really need to decide you know who who, who are the most who are the least evil who has the, which people have the le best incentives.
to be exercising this kind of power? And uh, I don't have an answer for you. I think we're going to have to stop right now. Uh, in the interest of time, we could go on, I think, all day. Uh, but uh, thanks to Professor McConnell, and we have about 10 minutes until the next presentation. Thank you.